Now, speaking of numbers, cancer by the numbers, just to give you a few basic statistics from IR, from the International Agency for Research on Cancer, this was the uh, last version, the 2018 data for global cancer statistics. You see there were 18 million new cases and sadly 9.6 million deaths. About one in five men will develop cancer, one in eight will die. For women, it's about one in six and about one in 11 when women will die of cancer. But what's most important for this talk is that the majority of new cases and new cancer deaths are occurring in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Moreover, most of the increase, the rapid increase, 70% increase in the next 20 years are expected to happen in low and middle income countries. So why is this? And how does this relate to women's health and women's health equity? How can we translate what we do know into policy making and more importantly, taking the policies back to the ground where it matters to impact population health. And that's the focus of this talk. In fact, if you look at both sexes, all ages, pink being breast cancer, you can see that breast cancer is the number one cause of cancer among individuals, regardless of, of sex, in 104 countries. When we look at women only, we see that breast cancer is by far the most common. In this case, this is age standardized incidence rates. So in 156 countries, breast cancer is the number one cancer. In the case of cervical cancer, the inequity is incredibly stark, but I also wanna demonstrate something here by region in Asia. Asia includes most of the world's women who, will develop, who have died of cervical cancer in 2018 and Africa here, 26%. Now this is a feature of course of the population size, but when you look at it another way, almost nine in 10 women who die of cervical cancer are living in a low and middle income country. And many of these women are in Asia. In fact, India alone has the largest number of women of any country, in fact, all of Africa combined of women who are dying of cervical cancer. And it really shouldn't be this way. And in fact, Dr. Tedros in 2018 called for the elimination of cervical cancer as a public health concern. I'm sure many of you know about this landmark uh, declaration. And in fact, the resolution was just passed at the World Health Assembly, which brings together member states' commitments to advance this uh, action. Cervical cancer strikes women in the prime of life. This is the other factor that often isn't uh, considered when we talk about cancer in women, breast and cervical cancer in low and middle income countries. The photo I showed you from Bangladesh, that woman was probably about 42, which is much more typical in low and middle income countries. It's affecting women in the prime of life. And it doesn't have to be this way. Cervical cancer, for example, is really one of the most preventable and treatable forms of cancer, as long as it's detected early and is treated properly. And the strategy here uh, was uh, partly uh, modeled, uh, not modeling in the statistical sense, but, well, it was, but also modeled in uh, the colloquial sense after um, HIV AIDS targets to try to have something aspirational we could get our heads around. 90, 70, 90, a global strategy, right? So efforts must be aligned and accelerated with the following targets. 90% coverage of HPV vaccination, 70% coverage of screening, with most women uh, being screened with a high performance test. I'll come back to that when we talk about the evidence between the ages of X and Y, 35, 45, et cetera. And most importantly, treatment of precancerous lesions and management of women with invasive cancer. All of this is necessary to eliminate cervical cancer. And I say this for an important reason. How are we going to get there, right? So here's the mortality impact of achieving the cervical cancer elimination tar targets, just one of many superb modeling analyses by this group, the three co-lead authors, here's Dr. Karen Canfeld, Jane Kim, and Mark Brisson, who have put together <clears throat> extremely important data to estimate when we think we're going to get to that elimination target. But how are we going to get there, right? So these findings emphasize the importance of acting immediately on all three fronts, scaling up vaccination, screening, and treatment, right? 
And in the next 10 years, a third reduction of the rate of premature mortality in LMICs is possible, which would contribute to the realization of the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals. And over the next century, if we could do this, we'd reduce cervical cancer mortality by almost 99% and saving 62 million lives. So how do we do that? Well, there's a situational analysis toolkit that was developed by the uh, BHGI uh, collaborators uh, funded by the Komen Foundation. There's examples of metrics you can look at and track. Won't go through this in any real detail, but they start with community-based awareness. What percentage of the population are aware of breast symptoms? Percentage of the population knowing where to go if they have a symptom, right? Provider breast uh, about provider awareness about breast health and then going down the list what is the percentage of patients with breast cancer diagnosed early at stage one or stage two right this is the resource level and some people may argue what are you talking about shouldn't everybody have the best possible access uh, best possible care in terms of diagnostic event evaluation shouldn't we all have access to a pet ct well in a you know, perfect world, the answer would be yes, but we live in reality. And in reality, going back to the ground shot or earth shot, it helps to actually look at what you have. So that situational analysis is not meant only for countries as a whole. And it has been used effectively in several countries, including Tanzania. I was lucky to participate in some of the evidence to policy work with the toolkit uh, informing the guidelines with that country's Ministry of Health. But to look at the subnational resources, even if you have um, a very high quality tertiary care facility in an urban center, if most of the population lives hours and hours away and they live in poverty, well, we need to look at what they have closer to home and how we can improve right care at primary care and at secondary level of care. Because most women, for example, with a breast mass will not have breast cancer and you can spare them traveling for a day uh, perhaps leaving their families, leaving their jobs, et cetera, to come and unfortunately also taking up sometimes a lot of room in the waiting areas in uh, overcrowded tertiary care facilities for a problem that turns out to be benign. So a lot can be done by bringing this care closer to home. And this brings me to uh, a topic that's uh, very close to my heart is about equity across the board. So who are the women who are less likely to access care? Who are the women who are less likely to utilize care if it does exist, and even if it is affordable? In any setting, it's the same groups. It's marginalized women. It's women who have uh, disadvantages, whether they're social, economic, based on their minority status, ethno-cultural status, or migration status. We put this together in a series in The Lancet a few years ago with about 40 authors <clears throat> from 18 countries, excuse me. All of these things are important. I won't go through this now, but to say that this um, diagram that is unpublished, but is based on a paper I worked on with um, the uh, head of uh, genetics at IARC and others, Dr. Paul Brennan and others, Nature Reviews Clinical Oncology. We looked at a population health equity framework for this was genomics and cancer prevention, but here I'm looking at global cancer prevention and control as it pertains to women. Starting with knowledge generation at the left-hand panel, knowledge integration and the research that informs and goes two ways, right? The iterative process from, especially with implementation research that feeds back into the population science, knowledge dissemination, including MNE, which of course is critically important in every setting, capacity building, the use of telepathology, telementoring. COVID has taught us a lot about how far we could go backwards in time, unfortunately, with poverty, maternal health, and also with cancer screening. And even the risk now is to uh, the acceleration we were about to have, we thought, on cervical screening. We don't want to have this setback, making the most of what we have in terms of telehealth and the impact on population health, right? Equitable access utilization of these services and what metrics are gonna be important. Not just new cancers averted and cancer deaths, but also disability adjusted life years gained and uh, discussions about patient reported outcomes. And you'll see here as this, based on the blue highways approach at the NIH, looking at the uh, translational cycle of research, we decided to place high resource 
and low resource settings in a, well, not a circle, but in a continuous fashion, right? It's not unidirectional. This is something that we learn from each other. We learn so much from research being done in low and middle income countries that are very much applicable to high resource settings and vice versa. And the last couple of seconds, I just want to mention the Lancet Commission. As I said at the beginning, we're fortunate to have uh, collaboration with the George Institute. In fact, the George Institute India with uh, Dr. Deva Kinambiar is one of our commissioners, which is just wonderful. The purpose of the commission is to advance an evidence-based gendered approach to cancer risk and cancer control. And we'll address urgent questions at the intersection of social inequality and cancer risk, as well as cancer outcomes and the status of women in society. It's been a great, great talk, Ophira. It's been really nice. You know, we've worked on many little things together. Our paths have crossed so many times. But I think today it has been really insightful listening to you and to all the people who are in the audience as well. And I see some very old friends in the audience who have been committed their entire lives almost to the task of cervical cancer screening. And I can say one thing that, you know, we've reached a point where as clinicians, we realize that we have a lot of the tools now, but we don't really know that how to bridge that gap. And I think your talk really gave us a dive today into looking at other aspects and perhaps bringing us a little bit closer to understanding how many people we need to bring together to get something. And especially when you talk about the three front approach, you know, it's the vaccination screening sort of go hand in hand, sort of because they're both preventive, but one is the pediatricians and the community people. And then the other is the gynecologists and again, the community people, but the treatment is a whole different group of people and then the palliation. So I think it was really nice to see all these various aspects but again, a little sad to see how much of the inequity is there. And while you mentioned cervical and breast both, but I think breast is something which still gets the eyeballs. And I remember when I was in South Africa with Lynette Denny, she would say, oh, everybody loves breast. Everybody is ready to run for breast. Cervical cancer, no one wants to talk about. So I think it was a really great day for us when Dr. Tedros really put that spotlight and said, we have to work on cervical cancer and we have to eliminate it. To your question about the pandemic itself impacting cancer prevention and screening, this is a huge problem. And there's a lot being written on this now. I'm actually part of uh, the global COVID and Cancer Global Modeling Consortium that's led by Dr. Karen Canfeld, the same person I mentioned earlier, the scientist doing all that great modeling work on cervical cancer at the University of New South Wales. She and her team on the modeling consortium are taking a very close look and trying to help predict to inform policymaking almost minute by minute and also into the future, because sadly, even with the vaccines, we're going to be dealing with this for some time to come. And also, sadly, it's not the only pandemic we're likely to experience in the coming years and decades. And so understanding the data is critical and looking at how we can mitigate the um, backpedaling on some of these uh, uh, targets. So for example, HPV, right? Back to that uh, HPV-based testing can be done with self-testing. They're self-testing. This is a fantastic invention that uh, sadly is still, again, too expensive for many countries. We need to do what we can to help um, implement strategies using this technology so that most women, most women are gonna test negative. They don't need to come back. They don't need to come in for a GYN exam if they have a negative HPV test that they could do at home. You know, This is an opportunity, COVID is calamity. It's also an opportunity to help leapfrog to help use telemedicine to virtual care, which is being done to an extent none of us thought was gonna be possible. Suddenly we're able to do it, right? When we put our minds to it, 
And so we should be able to mitigate the risk of sliding back on the prevention and screening side with uh, better information and advancing some of these strategies that, that can take advantage of the hands-free uh, type of uh, screening, for example.